Good morning, all of you. In uh, today's, uh, this week's Fellows Academic uh, module, we have Dr. Manoj Padman with us, and he's going to teach all of you about uh, management of coxavara in children. And uh, Dr. Manoj Padman is a well-known, renowned pediatric orthopedic surgeon from uh, uh, New Delhi. And he has been trained all across the world, uh, especially in Sheffield, UK. And uh, he has a great uh, interest in deformity correction. Uh, Dr. Gaurav, please take over the meeting. And uh, in the later half, Dr. Srinam and uh, Shalin would present one clinical case and we will discuss them. It's Gaurav. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Manoj, sir. So today... Hi, yeah. So uh, today we have a very interesting topic, Coxavara, its management, principles, and interesting cases. And this will be followed by two interesting cases by Dr. Sheenam and Dr. Shalim. So without wasting much time, I would request Dr. Manoj Padman to start his talk. So let me get my share screen up and running. I hope everyone can hear me and can see the screen. Yes, sir. Yeah. You can just it on full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes trying to, you know, give an overview on uh, uh, Oxalara, the basic uh, principles in terms of how to evaluate and manage it and uh, what my preferred options are. Uh, I understand that this is a uh, fellow level meeting. So, so uh, I, I think the, the basics would have been probably all of you must be pretty familiar with. And so I'm going to just kind of uh, uh, definitely put my own personal preferences and flavors on to what the basic principles are. So the I'm going to look at what should be the definition of uh, uh, Coxavara, rather than just from a radiological perspective, what are the different etiologies, a brief overview on developmental Coxavara um, with a lot of cases about it, uh, how to evaluate it, what are the radiological parameters that one needs to factor in, um, osteotomy principles rather than a, a specific method or technique, um, and uh, case examples. In a very simplistic uh, kind of uh, perspective, uh, uh, any reduction in the next shaft angle is Coxavara. But that I think is too simplistic a uh, uh, definition. So anything below 120 degrees, if you look at just one view and say that is that's coxavara, that's probably just one aspect of it, not the full full uh, component of it. Uh, for us to understand, you know, what coxavara is all about, we need to see how the proximal femur develops uh, logically, um, and it is one single physis extending from the medial aspect of the femoral neck right up to the trochanter. So unlike in the adult bone, unlike we are kind of used to seeing it as two distinct physis, well, uh, embryologically, the proximal femur develops as a single physis. And by age of uh, four, when the secondary ossification centers start appearing at both the trochanter and the femoral epiphysis, it separates out. Um, so the physis contributes to growth, the trochanteric uh, physis contributes to the trochanteric apophysial growth, the femoral uh, capital epiphysis helps the neck to uh, grow uh, in its uh, length, in its uh, uh, direction. The uh, bridging physis is responsible for the radial growth of the femoral neck. The, this principle is, um, this uh, uh, embryological uh, development is necessary for us to understand what contributes to varus and valgus. Um, from a deformity uh, perspective, we would like to know where the uh, cora is in the deformity. So in a varus deformity, if you have a mismatch between the femoral neck physis and the prochantric physis. So that if you can um, imagine that the femoral neck physis has stopped growing and the prochantric continues to overgrow. So that is what produces a varus deformity. And the opposite is what in the case of a valgus, wherein in the uh, prochantric uh, physis stops growing and the femoral neck continues to kind of grow. So that is in simplistic, in a deformity perspective, that's where the cora lies. So you can see the same thing if you do, if you do a planning you can see that the uh, red line is the uh, mechanical axis of the proximal segment and the blue line is, uh, is an extension of the distal femoral and you see where the cora is in a varus and a valgus deformity where it intersects 
in a core in a varus deformity the cora is much higher up because it's the medial side which stops growth and the trochanter continues to grow whereas in a valgus deformity which you would see in in classically in cerebral palsy um, the cora is uh, is much more lateral and this has some bearing in how you determine where you uh, you know what is the rationale behind uh, choosing your level of osteotomies and what are the secondary deformities which which we kind of uh, um, expect and which we need to tackle when we do a pure angular correction so you need to bear in mind where the cora is so yes coxavara is apart from just the, the obvious reduced neck shaft angle you have to understand it is that it's a manifestation of a proximal femoral growth disturbance that would be a more kind of more comprehensive understanding of what coxavara is and also um, an etiological classification of coxavara is important simply because the natural history of these conditions are different depending on what the etiology is a congenital uh, coxavara wherein there are associated femoral deformities and so i use the term congenital and what is conventionally used is when there is associated femoral deficiencies like a pfft or the current terminology of the congenital femoral deficiency is different from an acquired coxavara for a post traumatic or a post infective sequelae in the sequelae of perthes and skiffy can produce ddh coxavara happens only post treatment it does not happen naturally uh, metabolic conditions can produce uh, coxavara as you are well aware of and that can be a part of skeletal dysplasia so one needs to kind of always kind of factor in what the underlying etiology is so just to kind of illustrate a few um, uh, uh, case examples here um so the top left is the post septic sequelae although you might have to tease out the history of the sepsis it may be a just a prolonged in icu stay immediately after there may be no clear history of uh, sepsis the child presents with a gait abnormality at the age of 3 4 and you may have to actually tease out the this thing there is no gross abnormality there apart from coxavara that you can see um uh, so post septic sequelae one always have to bear in mind developmental coxavara is the bottom you can see clear radiological features of it and the top right is a as part of a congenital femoral deficiency you can see coxavara similarly there are other causes suppose ddh sequelae this was a conservatively managed ddh uh, treatment it was just managed with pavlik harness and it ended up with this degree of proximal femoral growth arrest secondary to avascular necrosis and you can see coxavara coxabrava there shepherd crook deformity apart from its three dimensional component has coxavara as well so all of these broadly fit into you know the category of coxavara osteogenesis imperfecta can produce coxavara you need to be careful that the sometimes it is pseudo coxavara it's actually the procovatum deformity of the proximal femur which gives you the appearance that there is coxavara so you really need to correct the for the procovatum deformity and see whether there is true coxavara and that's well in is illustrated in this case you can see it's grossly deformed you can look at the see the how the proximal femur is deformed and you would automatically assume that there is coxavara once you correct the femoral shaft deformities the neck shaft alignment is actually normal so there is no coxavara here it's actually the severe procovatum deformity that gives the impression we can have it as part of other syndromes prux syndrome where is multiple congenital contractures along with you know brittle bone disease or so it's a variant of osteogenesis imperfecta as part of congenital femoral deficiency even late presenting trauma technically you can see when it presents to you you to see coxavara in it because of uh, the neck shaft angle being malaligned as well as a trochanteric overgrowth so in my uh, definition i would consider this as you know a manifestation of a growth disturbance caused by a variety of etiologies and presenting with abductor insufficiency due to the trochanteric overgrowth which can be relative or absolute you can have associated coxa breva coxa irregularis coxa plana and in um, unilateral cases definitely limb length dis discrepancy simply because there is a growth disturbance even in bilateral cases you may have leg length discrepancy so that is what you are dealing with when you have um, uh, when you are talking about coxa vera rather than a simplistic definition of just an x shaft angle so developmental coxavara which is the kind of uh, you know prototype deformity let's say it's like has characteristic features it's characterized by a defective ossification of the femoral neck the inferior inferior medial neck has this triangular uh, segment um, it's relatively rare but we do see uh, certain parts of uh, the country uh, it's fairly kind of you know you clusters of uh, cases presenting there is no specific uh, sex or race predilection uh, from the uh, from uh, natural history studies in a third of cases its presence is bilateral deformities you need to rule out skeletal dysplasia and you can clearly see 
that the X-rays, you can see the vertically oriented physis with the triangular wedge inferiorly. They present when they start walking, usually by about three, three and a half years, um, with a painless limp and it's a gait abnormality. One uses the, and I'll talk about the HE angle, the Hilgenreiner epiphyseal angle, which is used as a uh, measure to kind of uh, prognosticate in terms of understand what the severity of the condition is, as well as for planning and timing your intervention. So any hip deformity, be it coxsevera or anything else, presents with all of these kind of uh, uh, problems, you know, specifically related to the uh, gait as well as with range of motion. Um, coxsevera, by and large, I specifically put pain and instability within brackets. They usually don't unless there are other kind of secondary problems, unless there is associated hip dysplasia um, due to some uh, follow-up of usually DDH treatment. They have instability, but otherwise coxsevera per se would not have any instability. So they usually have painless limb. Again, unless there are secondary problems. So when you evaluate uh, uh, any child, this is fairly standard. It's kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, fairly comprehensive for any hip pathology. You look at all these parameters, stands, gait, deformities, and, and range of motion. Look at the torsional profile, leg length discrepancy. And that's how you would kind of evaluate any hip. Nothing's unique to Coxavara as such. You would need a certain basic set of radiological evaluation, definitely to views of the pelvis. The pelvis AP and a frog leg lateral is what I use. If there is associated leg length discrepancy or if there is, you know, axis deviation, then you need to have a mechanical axis views. Special views are not so important, again, you know, for pure coxavera because you, unless you suspect some amount of acetabular dysplasia and you want to see what position it sits in. And complex deformities, you want to evaluate it three-dimensionally, you want a CT scanner. That's probably that's probably what is needed. You don't need to need, do anything more than that in, in, in most cases. So in terms of uh, the radiological, the basic radiology in plane radiography, the neck shaft angle is, as you're all well aware, the range is between 120 to 135. Um, it's called as a medial neck shaft angle or the neck shaft angle. That's based on the anatomical axis of the femur. This is the index which is used for, especially for developmental coxavera, the Hilgenreiner epiphyseal angle, wherein the Hilgenreiner horizontal line and the angle formed with the orientation of the physis. So you want it to be less than 25 degrees, which is the normal range. You have, if you have a unilateral pathology, you can compare it to the other side, which essentially means that the physis, you want to be more horizontal rather than vertical. As it goes more vertical, the deformity increases, shear forces increases. So up to about um, uh, less than 25 is normal. Um, definitely, as it goes above 60, definitely it needs intervention. So between 45 and 60 is one where you would kind of wait and watch or depending on, you know, um, how the symptoms are. So it is useful to prognosticate and plan your timing of intervention. So then you have also the medial proximal femoral angle. That's important because that's a useful measure for understanding what is a what is the kind of extent of uh, trochanteric overgrowth, whether the trochanteric overgrowth is disproportionate to the uh, varus deformity of the neck, you know. So you can use the LPFA as well, but LPFA uses the mechanical axis, so you really need the whole limb. But MPFA is much more practical because you use the anatomical axis. Of the femur. And I would urge you to also use the articular trochanteric distance. You want to see the vertical uh, offset between the uh, tip of the trochanter, which should be at the level of the uh, femoral center of the femoral head as well as the uh, uh, to the top of the femoral head so you want to see the vertical distance um, anything above that above the level above the center of the head would be considered as uh, also producing uh, functional coxavara because of abductor insufficiency so you don't want the tip of the trochanter to be above the center of the femoral head so those are basic kind of radiological parameters you also want to kind of look at Axis here is a case of you can see. I don't know whether you can appreciate it on the right side. You have a complex uh, deformity. This is a fibrous dysplasia, but you can see the leg length discrepancy, which has been equalized with blocks. You can see the different knee level joints. So, whatever correction that you do at the proximal femur, you need to factor that in, uh, you know, because that may require additional procedures. And here is a case wherein it looks like a straightforward. This is a post septic sequelae uh, of the uh, left hip. You can see the torsional abnormality even on the on the frog leg lateral. You can increase antiversion on the left side. So there are other secondary uh, deformities in other planes which you need to kind of uh, uh, evaluate and pick up. So it's just not a single plane correction. In terms of uh, treatment, it's fairly easy. Varus deformity, you need to correct it to a, a valgus osteotomy. You know, so that is uh, you know that's as simplistic as it can get. The 
The questions that you need to kind of answer is like, what is the level at which you're going to kind of correct this deformity? Is it subtrochantric or interprochantric? And why do you choose to do so? What is the type of uh, correction that you want to do? Is it an angulation? Do you take wedges out? What is the effect on limb length? What is the effect on muscle tension because you are lengthening the leg by a valgus osteotomy? What are your hardware choices? How do you determine a particular implant over there? Do you need to be fixated with a particular implant all the time? You need to factor in biology in terms of what is the growth remaining, because if you don't address a trochanter, trochanter may continue to overgrow. You need to see what is the impact on the physis by increasing a lot of the coxavara corrections. You will see on long-term follow-up x-rays that the femoral capital physis fuses, which has an implication in the remaining growth. Adjunct procedures will be needed sometimes to achieve correction, which can be in simple terms of tissue releases but it may need other corrective procedures as well. And I, as, as I alluded to earlier, underlying pathology has a bearing in how you kind of address this. So, so here I've put in an illustration from uh, Paley's book about you know, how you, you know, where do you do your correction. So in a Coxavara correction, the rationale is that you correct it at the subtrochantric level. And there are quite a few reasons for it because A, um, the cora is Ideally, for any angular deformity, be it any this thing, the, correct, the simplest correction is at the level of the cora, which will then correct the deformity by pure angulation. If you move away from the cora, in this case, you can't correct it at the cora because the cora is at the physis at the this thing. You can't do an osteotomy at that level. So you are, the biology dictates that you move away from the cora. Once you move away from the cora, there will always be translation. Okay, And so you need to factor it then. And in this case, because you are further away from the cora at the lesser trochanter, below the lesser trochanter, there is a fair amount of lateral translation, which is necessary to align the mechanical axis. Whereas if you're correcting a fox avara, you correct it, you correct it above the, it's at, corrected at the intertrochantric level. So it's a little bit more closer to the cora. The translation is lesser. So yes, there is some amount of medial translation, but the translation is lesser. So valgus osteotomy will increase length and there is a lot of translation and therefore it is better to do it at the subtrochantric level because if you do it anywhere above the trochanter, the iliosoas gets lengthened and so that can produce a flexion deformity. So, so valgus osteotomy and for step, to achieve a stable fixation to have enough hold on the proximal fragment, it is um, uh, better corrected at the subtrochantric level. Historically, um, Powell's osteotomy is done at the intertrochantric level further higher up and you are then constrained by the amount of bone that you can work with, you know, with modern implants, you know, you need adequate holds so that you can reduce the spica time or you can eliminate spica altogether. If you go proximally, yes, it can correct. You can't correct large, you can't correct large deformities because, you know, you need to take a big chunk of this, uh, bone out uh, with a um, Powell's Y-shaped osteotomy or a V-osteotomy with a lateral closing wedge. You can correct small deformities. The advantage is you don't need to translate uh, too much because you're closer to the cora. But subtrochantric osteotomy, by definition, is for valgus osteotomy, uh, is done at that level. Whereas varus osteotomy for reducing a subluxed hip in a, in a CP classically, um, you do it further up at the intertrochantric level, so it's closer to the cora, so very less translation is needed. But the, the downside is that you know the trochanter becomes prominent, the abductor becomes insufficient, and the hardware can be prominent there. You know, it will it will create a Friedlander gate. Before any of these osteotomies, and specifically now I'll just focus on the valgus osteotomy, you need to look at the range of hip motion. You need to see what the fixed deformities are. The proximal fragment is adducted, so you need to have free adduction to do any valgus deformity. And this is valid in congenital uh, deformities, wherein like, you know, like a congenital femoral deficiency or a PFFT, you have soft tissue contractures, which may preclude your um, adduction, hip ad adduction. And that is factored in by you know, the so-called super hip procedure, part of the component, part of the procedure is extensive release of the um, abductor mechanism so that there is enough adduction and the external rotation deformity is corrected. Um, so that's important. Similarly, when you kind of angulate the distal fragment, you need the distal fragment to move laterally. And so then you, the, you may need to do adductor release to kind of, so you may need to do releases judiciously to kind of achieve your degree of correction. Torsional profile, is important, it's obvious and it's important. Dibling discrepancy has to be factored in any uh, correction uh, and you have to look at the rest of the femur as well. So here is a, a development, here is a case of Coxavara secondary to a congenital femoral deficiency. Um, it's just an illustrative case and I'll take you through, um, you know, how I uh, correct the deformity. I do not take any wedges out, it's a subtrochantric level. 
Um, yes, this osteotomy is necessary. This is not the uh, uh, be all and end all for this particular condition because you need to subsequently lengthen. And for lengthening, you need to kind of make sure that the proximal femur is well aligned and any establer dysplasia is corrected prior to any lengthening. So the osteotomy is done prior to length equalization procedure further down the line. So it's a subtrochanteric transverse osteotomy with lateral translation. So this is a bilateral coxavera. We could not identify any obvious skeletal dysplasia as such. Late presenting, presented about eight years of age, severe deformity. So this is what I would kind of look at planning. Here there is nothing to look at the hilgen reiner epiphyseal angle. It's well above 90 degrees, you know, so it's way past correction. You can see the um, bottom pictures. You can see the uh, neck shaft angle and the MPFA uh, uh, to see the, the extent of procantric overgrowth. So these are the fluoro pictures, and you which again illustrate the degree of uh, deformity. So if you, uh, the neck shaft angle is, uh, is about 60 degrees, and the MPFA is also significantly affected. There is also torsional abnormality in this. So it tells you the magnitude of correction that is required. Now, it is important to kind of look at both the MPFA and the neck shaft angle to see what is a, what is a difference in this thing. Are they kind of correspond? If there is a disproportionate increase of the uh, uh, disproportionate reduction of the MPFA uh, that, that is, which kind of alludes to that there is a much more component of trochanteric overgrowth and so you may need to kind of think about some form of uh, a simple valgus osteotomy may not correct it and we'll um, uh, illustrate this point with a case subsequently. So you need to look at that measurement as well. What is the difference in uh, uh, the MPFA as well? So transverse osteotomy at the subtrochanteric level, you Aim your proximal fixation device, uh, whatever uh, fixation device that you choose to. Um, um, a fixed angle rigid device is uh, is my preferred option, whether you choose a blade plate or any form of proximal femoral locking plate. Um, get it into the center of the femoral neck. You can't go across the physis. Um, do a subtrochanteric osteotomy. I do not take any wedges. It's not necessary in children. Um, translate it. If you find that the soft tissues are not allowing adequate translation, you may have to do an adductor release. And you may even have to shorten um, to kind of get it aligned. And in severe deformities, it will not be an end-to-end -end apposition. It will be an end-to-side apposition. The proximal fragment, the side is abutted against the uh, distal fragment. So it's an end-to-side apposition. Uh, a straight plate allows translation. So these are the factors that you need to kind of look at. So that's what it looks like. You need to make sure that your screws are in the right profile, even on the uh, lateral view. Similarly, on the opposite side as well, similar deformities. Uh, you can see that uh, the magnitude of the neck shaft angle uh, reduction is much more than the MPFA. So it's primarily a, a, a neck shaft abnormality rather than a trochanteric overgrowth. So here, a subtrochanteric osteotomy should do the correction. One always has to look at these long-standing deformities on the acetabular side because valgus correction uncovers the femoral head. So, so you need to look at the acetabular side. So especially in congenital conditions, congenital femoral de deficiencies, you may have to kind of uh, do an additional adjunct um, pelvic procedure, usually a DEGA, to ensure that, that the coverage is adequate. And this is important for future lengthening because if you have any form of dysplasia there, the future lengthening can cause the hip to subluxate. That's the same child at uh, six months follow up. Um, one would argue that there is probably some loss of uh, uh, correction because the trochanter is not, uh, is still kind of at a slightly higher level. I always add an, a, a trochanteric uh, epiphysiodesis uh, um, to ensure that the trochanter does not overgrow. In this case, you can still see the growth plate, probably it's not as effective. This was a drill epiphysiodesis. Um, subsequently, I switched to you know putting a screw in. And also, trochanteric epiphysiodesis. You know, ideally should be done in the younger child. Over an eight-year-old, it probably doesn't work. So that's, uh, you can see that the MPFA is not corrected as much as you would uh, this thing. Um, sometimes in these cases, you can't see the, visualize the epiphysis very well. So using the HE angle as an index of correction, I have found it practically difficult because I don't know where the epiphysis is in these cases. The physial line, rather. That's one year the correction is maintained. The child is doing well. We've removed the implant. And at that time, I completed the trochanteric uh, epiphysiodesis and put a screw across, though I'm not very confident that's going to add anything to the uh, correction. Um, I haven't seen the child for the last two years because of lockdown, but, but the pe 
feedback that I've got is the child is doing well apart from uh, not being able to sit cross-legged. So here's another case uh, presented much younger, probably around four, four and a half years. This is the usual age at which they present. Um, you can see again, even though it's bilateral, the degree of deformity is much higher uh, on one side, on the right side. Now with modern software, you can use a lot of these planning. You can use your, this is with uh, the Bone Ninja. You can measure and do your uh, planning um, using the software. Again, this is the case where I would allude to where I cannot really appreciate what the, where the physial orientation is to accurately determine where the HE angle is to achieve what the final correction is. Because prognostically, if you achieve um, HE angle correction at below 37, 38 degrees, the chance of recurrence are very uh, low. Um, so I use the neck shaft and the MPFA as a uh, surrogate marker for my correction. So that's my planning. And that's what you kind of hope to achieve. Um, you can see that on the right side, you had to go end up go end to side opposition, whereas on the left, there is still some contact end to end uh, because the deformity was lesser. And I've started putting a screw across rather than just drilling. And this, I would expect that this would work because the child is younger, procantric of diffusities to work better should be ideally done below eight years of age. So that's what it looks like. And that's what the child was uh, when they came one year post-op. Now you can see that on the right side, the severe deformity, the degree of correction, you can see that the capital epiphysis is no longer seen. So these cases need to be followed up because you do not know, you know, yes, it is sitting in the head, the angles are correct, but growth is kind of, you know, close. And that's well reported in, in, in these corrections because I suspect that, you know, the amount of force going across the physis there, once you correct it, causes the physis to close prematurely. So they need long-term follow-up. Now, in terms of choosing your hardware, not all valgus plates are the same. So both, you know, you see on the right side is a 150 degree plate. Now that plate will not allow you to translate laterally because of the medial upset. So that's a faulty design. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, so that's not a correct implant, even though it's a 150 degrees. Um, so, so it will not allow you to kind of translate laterally. And you've seen all my cases that need to translate laterally to restore your axis. So that's necessary. You need a straight plate, uh, you know, at the subprocantric level. To kind of, if you have a medial offset plate, that's going to push your fragment medially, and that will kind of just um, uh, move your axis, mechanical axis, um, uh, correspondingly laterally. So it will off load the lateral compartment. So you really need to kind of restore your axis. It doesn't always have to be a this thing. So here is a, a blade plate which, which I've used earlier. Um, I need to kind of reduce the, this thing. Some of these double angle plates will again push it back. So I reduce this thing to increase the valgus angulation. So you can use the same hardware, um, a different hardware to achieve the same results. So it doesn't have to be a this thing, but so long as you understand that if you have any plate which has a significant medial offset, it will produce, uh, it will stop you from translating. So this is a blade plate which I'd used for a couple of cases earlier on. Certain pathologies, you need to kind of change your hardware because here you have a diaphysial deformity as well. So you need to correct it further down the line. So you need some control over the uh, shaft as well. So this had correction at two levels and therefore, uh, you know, you need some intramedullary hold as well. In cases like this, osteogenesis is imperfecta, where there is true virus, where there's a failed implant which had been put elsewhere. You, have, you need to use uh, uh, Fasius technique, which is the modification of the Wagner technique to get K wires into the uh, neck fragment so that you can control the proximal fragment. So correction, depending on what the pathology is, you may have to kind of uh, choose your implants, implants for uh, the specific pathology. Here is a post-septic sequelae with a clear pseudoarthrosis and ephemeral uh, oh, procantric overgrowth. Clearly there is, you can't appreciate the neck shaft angle as well, but this is clearly, uh, uh, you know, an extreme coxavara. Here the biology is not in your favor. So yes, you need a valgus osteotomy, but you need to kind of get some uh, biology across the pseudoarthrosis site. So a fibula graft was put across. And because we felt that the degree of valgus uh, deformity was kind of, Uncovering the femoral head a little bit on, the, on our arthrogram, we felt that there is some amount of acetabular dysplasia. You can see on the far right, a dega was added just to make sure that, that A, that there is no instability. Plus, this child would need lengthening at a future date. So that is going to kind of put a lot of load across the hip, and therefore, it needs to be corrected. So that's what the child looked at six months down the line. So 
So that is that should work for most cases, but there are certain situations wherein you would need to kind of add in other things, especially if there is significant coxa breva and the trochanteric overgrowth is disproportionate. If the trochanter has gone up much higher and the neck shaft angle is not so much altered, but the MPFA is significantly altered, then you need to consider neck lengthening osteotomies. True neck lengthening, Morsher or Wagner, I don't have any experience with it. I am. Um, uh, I haven't felt the need, kind of, I haven't identified any patients who would specifically benefit from it. And though uh, Morsha osteotomy would lengthen and would give some additional length benefit as well. So there may be certain indications where you can use it. Um, so where these situations are needed. So um, I've, uh, I would prefer to do the uh, relative neck lengthening after safe surgical dislocation and uh, having uh, collaborated with Prasad for a few cases. So this is something which I've kind of uh, uh, works better in my hands. So the, um, if once the, if the uh, physis are closed and it's closer to skeletal maturity and you have an isolated proximal overgrowth of the trochanter, you can consider distal transfer of greater trochanter, which used to be done uh, quite a lot during my fellowship days and all, but these days we don't do that because uh, safe surgical dislocation and uh, raising the flap and getting the trochanter distal is much better. So here is a case, which was a 10 year old with a DDH, uh, who was treated elsewhere. Um, and this is how the girl presented with, you can see that the neck shaft angle is not uh, uh, severely affected. Um, I would say it's close to about, you know, 110, 120, whereas the MPFA is much more. So there is significant trochanteric overgrowth. In addition to a short neck, uh, acetabular dysplasia, you can see there is some amount of necrotic segment in the uh, femoral head with a large mushroom, coxa magna. So um, whether it would sit in better, um, even though on the abduction view, it seems to kind of sit very well. Um, so you have to factor in uh, a pelvic osteotomy as well, some form of pelvic osteotomy to kind of address it. Additional imaging, the CT section shows the mushroom shaped head, the extent of uncovering, as well as the central necro necrotic fragment. Um, so here, this is the case wherein you would really want to lengthen the femoral neck. Uh, and and um, my preferred option here would be a safe surgical dislocation, raising the flap, dislice the trochanter, address the, uh, use the safe surgical dislocation to address whatever, uh, you know, reshape the femoral head as best as you can and address the pelvic osteo and uh, correct the pelvic uh, acetabular dysplasia as well. So this is what we did. Um, um, one could argue that you probably need more correction on the pelvic side, but the uh, DEGA seemed to achieve the desired results, but um, a lot of surgery to do on the femoral side. So um, we did, although we had contemplated considering maybe a triple, but finally we ended up just doing a DEGA. Um, so, got the trochanter down, the neck shaft is unchanged, but the neck has been lengthened, the neck shaft angle has remained the same, the MPFA is much better, the femoral head seems to be, this is not a, the classical conventional uh, head reduction, but it is almost like a reshaping uh, of head, Ex segment was excised and just, the, of the necrotic head was excised just to kind of get the head as spherical as possible. I think that's probably it. Uh, I don't know how I've done with time. Uh, in term, so one, one needs to look at uh, hip deformity as a comprehensive evaluation rather than just look at unidimensional neck shaft angle. Um, etiopathogenesis has a bearing in, in terms of how you address this. Plan it well. In terms of uh, preparing to address this, one needs to choose a surgical technique and an implant which, which one is comfortable with. Uh, Long-term follow-up and is mandatory for a lot of these pathologies. Thank you. So, thank you, sir, for the detailed uh, information about Coxavara. And we have a lot of questions, but considering the limitation of time, we'll address a few. And the rest of the questions can be answered on the WhatsApp group. So, first question by Molin, sir. What are the factors responsible for relapse in developmental Coxavara? Yeah. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. So, so it, it is uh, the uh, the single most factor is is the adequacy of correction, and and that is why the HE angle has been kind of used as a prognostic factor. Um, you want the HE angle to be corrected. Uh, I mean, the studies which have got drawn a cutoff of over thirty eight degrees or thirty nine degrees, but you want it to be less than forty degrees for sure. 
so adequate correction is the is the sing, is the number one factor uh, i would consider um, not addressing the uh, trochanteric growth plate um, although you may restore the next shaft angle adequately but then continuing trochanteric overgrowth can produce abductor insufficiency and therefore can have a um, you know a symptomatic occurrence in terms of the lurch still being present Another question by uh, Dr. Anil. Any neurovascular complications faced due to medial dissection and translation? The medial dissection meaning, um, I'm not very sure what, what medial dissection you would I mean the, I think the proximal fragment, which is going medial, way medial. So the proximal fragment, no. The proximal fragment is adducted. So you need to have adequate, there should not be any intra-articular or extra-articular ob obstacles to adduction. So if, you, if the question is in terms of uh, whether the uh, proximal spike is abutting medially and whether it's pressing on any tissues, no, they will remodel within 6-12 months, you will find that the shaft is aligned. And uh, translation also uh, is, is not a concern. I would, in, in, in long-standing congenital deformities especially, the soft tissue release is, uh, is mandatory. Um, you, you may have to do an extra articular, uh, what, what, what we used to do in... Uh, like a Sauter's release, you know, the abductor release from the uh, outer table of the ileum to get the proximal fragment to adduct, um, you know, and that can, that's elegantly put as part of the super hip procedure. Um, and you may also need to do an adductor tenotomy to get the distal fragment to kind of uh, abduct. Um, so, so both the releases may be needed. When in doubt, you know, compromise on the length, you know, shorten so that you don't produce any of this thing. So I have had one case wherein it was a lot of delayed union, where I think it was just a soft tissue tension, which kind of uh, took a lot of time to heal the osteotomy. Otherwise, you know, union also is not a problem. So uh, none of these complications I have encountered. Okay, sir. One question by Dr. Puneet. Wouldn't this translation technique follow osteotomy rule three and shift the mechanical axis parallel and lateral to its ideal position? Yes, it is. It follows the osteotomy rules that you are translating to, to, that because you are doing the osteotomy and the angulation of correction away from the coral, correction will happen inevitably with translation. And therefore, you need to kind of translate it so that you restore the axis. Right, sir. Dr. Vigneshwara has asked, what is the youngest age the valgus osteotomy can be performed? So that is a, uh, so it depends on what the pathology is. Um, I, I don't think I've done anyone under three and a half or a, 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 a anything like that, because any sequel, a, even if it's a post-infective sequel, most of these usually are painless limbs. So unless they start walking and, you, you know, they're mature enough. Developmental coxavara, you need to kind of, nobody presents with that degree of uh, deformity um, early on for you to kind of correct. The only situation wherein you would see, you would make the diagnosis of a coxavara is usually a congenital femoral deficiency. And therein, the correction of coxavara is all, all uh, is always for as a preparation for future lengthening. So I would say probably about four or five, and sometimes it is dictated by the size of the implant, size of the child as well. So you hardly ever need to do it in in a child younger than that. So one last question: When when do you add degas? Yeah. So dega is I have a very low threshold for dega wherein I anticipate a future lengthening uh, because. Future lengthening in any amount of acetabular dysplasia, even subtle acetabular dysplasia, will put a lot of stress on the hip and cause the hip to sub subluxate. When in doubt, I would also, so cases like a congenital femoral deficiency, um, long standing, uh, like the case wherein uh, the post septic sequelae with pseudoarthrosis, where there is a length discrepancy and where there is future lengthening. So I would always do an intra op arthrogram. If the uh, acetabular index is borderline, I would, if it is abnormal, definitely. If it's, even if it's borderline in those situations, I would, I would kind of uh, uh, add a DEGA. Uh, you hardly ever need it for uh, developmental coxavara, although, the, although some older children, about eight, nine years, you see that the acetabular index is so high and you wonder. But because you're not planning any future lengthening, I think you can get away with it. But where there is future lengthening, any subtle acetabular dysplasia, I would address. Thank you, sir, for this comprehensive talk and answering all these questions. I'll ask the rest of the questions to you on WhatsApp and answer them on the group. So now, oh, I would... Gaurav, can I yeah. interrupt? Yes, sir. Prasad is here. That was a wonderful talk. <clears throat> Not only fellows, consultants also learned a lot of things. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> Prasad is here. Prasad, you 
by the time Sheenam loads her presentation, would you like to have comment or anything else you want to share with fellows? Can you unmute yourself? Okay. I know there's background AC noise in my room, sorry. All right. Uh, anyway, two things. One, Manoj, nice talk, nice uh, coverage. Do you really believe that Cora is in the center of the head for wearers? <laughs> so, how can, how yeah, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, sure. give, me, give me a minute. How can Cora be in an area where you cannot uh, get complete correction even if you can do an osteotomy? Right? Tell me what osteotomy in the center of the head I can do. Say, practically, I can cut it there, right? Will I get the correction of Caxavera by doing anything at the head level? Um, no, I, I see that is why I alluded to that it is not just at a single level there. So um, it is useful to kind of uh, help you understand, but, but, but at least from in my perspective, that you are kind of doing the correction away from the Cora. So I'm not saying it's at the center of the head because it is it's not just at that level. So I don't think you can unless you have a unless you have a skiffy wherein a various deformity is produced by that level. It is between the prices so, uh, to the propeller. Manoj, that's, Manoj, that's Manoj and Prasad, I'll intervene here because yeah. <laughs> your discussion is a little yeah. difficult for me yeah. to understand. So I, yeah. I'm sure fellows are not understanding. So I was asking Prasad that if any important point has been missed uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. to elucidate to the fellows, yeah. then you can uh, talk about it. All right. Let, 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 you let, can let, start sharing your screen in the meantime. No, no, let, oh, yeah. let me clarify okay. for, the, for the fellows. For the yeah. fellows, look at the head to neck deformity, where this can be between the head and the neck like a slip. Yeah. You can have an intertrochantric deformity between the neck and the uh, shaft. You can have a neck deformity like a remodeled neck, but look at that's where the cora should be, where the deformity is, right? Second point is I just want to clarify this medial uh, uh, LT, when you do a lot of lateral translation, does cause. LT impingement. I've had to treat a, a couple of hips uh, lately. So there is that uh, thing you need to watch for. When I do this translation, I check intraoperatively in adduction, flexion and extension to see if there's any blockage to motion, right? It's an important uh, checkup so that you don't need to have to operate again to remove the LT. All right. And at, at times, you know, I have removed a small triangular part from the proximal fragment so that I can increase the contact area and use that graft between the plate and the proximal segment. Manoj, I, I saw one in one of the cases you have done that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. It, it has benefits. It, it kind of uh, gets you better contact, no doubt about it, and bone graft, yeah. It's definitely used. So for all, all the fellows, you know, when you use this uh, synthesis type of plate at, at the beginning, you, you are worried that there is complete translation and whether it will end up in non-union, but they all heal very well. And our primary aim is to correct the uh, the pseudoarthrosis at neck. So I have also been puzzled in some earlier cases, but they heal very well. Yeah. Fine, Gaurav, you can uh, yeah, Sheenam, you can start with the presentation. Okay, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Dr. Sheenam. So we will uh, discuss this case. Eight years male, uh, eight years male came to us with complaint of limp since early childhood. He had septic hip, hip which was neglected. On examination, there was short limb gait. On the right side, there was six centimeter shortening. And on, exam on examination, there was restricted abduction and internal rotation on the right side. And Trendlenburg test was positive. X-ray revealed a non-union femur neck fracture. There was a obvious gap was present. So, Shinam, can you stop there? Can you? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is a typical story, Manoj uh, and Prasad, we see that, uh, they, of course, this patient was from very uh, lim resource limited background. As in a, in a child that had uh, infection, which was treated after three weeks of onset of symptoms. And then on the child is suffering for the limb limited motion. And this is one of our driver's relative. So based on this x-ray, what uh, Manoj, can you define the problem or can you like to elucidate what it is, what's going on? Manoj? 
is he here i'm not i'm there i'm there ah, ah, just, please I'm not trying. so there is severe clearly there is severe uh, coxavara with overriding of the trochanter you know um, i think you, you're not able to see it well but the trochanter is high high riding and there is pseudoarthrosis um so the next shaft angle is grossly distorted there is retroversion um i would be concerned about the degree of acetabular dysplasia, dysplasia. yeah that's massive there you know it's like the acetabulum is vertical so so that is a big concern here um and i think there was another x ray which was a little bit more clearer an ap view yeah so that uh, that would um, so that was the question now shinam wants to present and not there's a case so we have to take the case sure. through discussion shinam you have opened the cards anyways to so show the adductor view so as manoj suggested one should do the adduction film to see what is the real neck shaft angle so so manoj this is the situation yeah 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 so so there is uh, the, the, the good range of motion there but all, you know so so there is enough adduction um so you can um definitely consider a subtrochanteric valgus osteotomy here uh, but there is pseudoarthrosis across the neck segment to the uh, to the head um so just you know so the so something needs to be done to address the biology there um and uh, the stabler index is on the higher side here um how old did they say the child was 8 8 years eight old year. yeah so so i would uh, look at uh, doing a valgus osteotomy here getting a fibula across in, across the pseudoarthrotic segment and addressing the acetabulum in this case even though um you know i don't know what the leg leg discrepancy is but the stabular index is quite high for an 8 year old so prasad uh, anything else now there is no uh, dr shakti das is asking where is the trochanter trochanter is lying little yeah. up but uh, it's it's not very uh, clearly visible there is some rarefaction there also so i agree with uh, manoj all the points prasad would you like to add any point no 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 i am i agree with him this is this requires uh, both stabular and femoral correction and make the pseudoarthrosis heal so i agree with him this plan is good now this patient is not going to afford any uh, kind of uh, locking plate or as, as i said so what sort of implant uh, you you like to use for such or you just contour the plate uh, manoj and uh, prasad prasad has practice in the that's never never been a problem for you <laughs> well <laughs> anyway the, the implant is only so you see you can get the correction first provisionally yeah. fix it and put whatever implant you want afterwards right right the implant based correction right with fixed angle device but that's not essential yeah you get your correction fix it and do whatever you need to if the implant is weak put a spiker cast on top of it right so manoj what would be the choice if uh, the child says i can't uh, deal with this locking plate or something yeah i mean see uh, see at the end of the day the, the locking plate offers you know some uh, a lot of advantages but uh, like prasad said the key is to get the correction done and you can kind of uh, um, you can you can kind of the valgus osteotomy can be stabilized um, with other ways as well a pre bent plate you can use um, you can use a um, you you can use an intramedullary uh, 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 rush nail with a tension band to kind of secure the abductors um but you will need to kind of supplement it with a spica and ensure that you know there are so there are ways to kind of address it right provided you get the axis aligned um, and you can you can uh, get stability um so that's not a problem so but you will need to supplement it with a spica right yeah shinam go ahead and show the planning <laughs> and then let, let me first gorav you have to mute you are uh, uh, the <laughs> otherwise we'll listen to all the music okay yeah shinam go ahead uh neck shaft angle came out to be around 80 degrees so we uh planned uh as we know biomechanics of the normal hip there is a development of hip joint depends on the two forces that is joint reaction force and trochanteric force 
and in the coxa vera there is a resultant a result a hip joint reactant force will lead to bending forces or uh, will create bending forces due to weak abductors and there will be a uh, there will be rocket trochanter in the powell's osteotomy we will remove we remove the uh, wedge and uh, in the subtrochanteric osteotomy it is only uh, it is transverse osteotomy below the lesser trochanter so uh, we plan to do the subtrochanteric osteotomy with fibula strut grafting and then we apply the plate a uh, reconstruction plate and along with it degas estabuloplasty was done so uh, manoj this is as you mentioned and for all the fellows you know if we can we have just used the simple reconstruction plate at that time even we did not have this locking plates but now we have a locking recon plate which you can contour nicely and uh, to put this uh, fibula one can use a, a a small dhs reamer and or a bigger drill bit uh, you look at the fibula uh, size and you drill it and then uh, you can fix it and once you put this now the question is also that you will need to correct it you hold with a temporary screw out of plate and then make the hole for the fibula then put a fibula and then you contour your plate you may use a temporary k wire for templating and then that's a technically a bit challenging but this can be done and of course dega should be done this child we just saw him yesterday is still 6 cm short he will need lengthening and so estabular uh, coverage is important yeah shina go ahead there are many papers back to back uh, which also reveal the importance of fibular grafting along with fixation there is a paper uh, in the journal of pediatric orthopedics uh, which also revealed the importance of subtrochanteric valgization osteotomy uh, this is a uh, this is a follow up x ray we can see well healed osteotomy site and correction of neck shaft angle and he angle and after the removal of plate we can see a well healed now the question is can you go back to that image prasad now it feels that we lost the estabular correction in the course do you, do you think so yes or that that, is... that graft has got uh, compressed or something i don't know what why it happened so well when I mean, you you didn't lose as much as you thought you think but that is subluxated so you you need to be prepared to uh, stabilize the hip better before you do any lengthening yes 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 so now that patient again lost to follow up as shinam was to present this case i called the parents yesterday and said he has started having some pain it has been 4 5 years uh, before uh, this so i'm i hope this child is not subluxating out so maybe i'll share those x rays you know the child was to come yesterday but could not come so i'll share those x rays fellows group and to manoj and uh so manoj is there's been your experience or uh, what do you do for the something to not to lose a uh, dega correction or just the profile is looking like that so do no, i mean the, definitely there are, there are a few instances wherein um you know the improperative correction uh, that you achieve and, and you see that there's you've lost some of it um i recently saw you know a ddh case where in you know an older child had, and it's it's completely like you know it's almost as if the dega was not done at all you know so it's that it can happen um the question is not what is the end point of your uh, distraction on dega where at one point we are in fear that it would impinge and when at one point at the other other end you know we uh, we are fear of under correction so prasad any take on that Uh, no, at this age, don't worry about impingement. You can you can correct that afterwards with a simpler rim trimming if need if need be. I don't think they'll impinge, but get more, get go for more correction. Try to flatten the roof as much as you can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So clinical outcome was good in the early one two years follow up. Show the clinical images. You know. 
and child was happy limp was gone but uh, you know i anticipated that in adolescent child would come back with some other problems so maybe in next meeting i'll show the follow up uh, x rays and video nice shinam thank you for this uh, case uh, <clears throat> shalin can you share your screen we'll quickly go to the second case ah uh, this is last slide was very good okay shalin is here Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is the next case for the day. We had a four-year-old boy who presented to us with abnormal walking pattern. His birth history was normal. There was no history of birth time hypoxia. However, there was a history of NICU admission at one month of age for three weeks, which required. IV antibiotic administration, and uh, his parents noted that he had abnormal walking pattern since he started walking. So on examination, he had a painless limp. He walked with waddling gait. Uh, he had bilateral positive foot progression angle, and there was increase in lumbar lordosis. All of these findings are visible on the video. And on further examination. the hip showed the bilateral restriction of internal rotation and the examination of the hip showed a femoral retroversion of around 10 degrees which was confirmed so so we got the radiograph then and revealed to be a bilateral case of bilateral coxa vara with uh, some amount of femoral ero head erosions also we did the skeletal survey and it did not turn out to be a any form of dysplasia so uh, you are suspecting a form of infective post infective coxa vara so uh, shali so let's a, uh, this just a moment which is why we did the skeletal survey but uh, did not turn out to be a dysplasia so we, manoj uh, what what would be your take here i mean on the on the left side is more dysplastic acetabulum compared to the right yeah so how would you proceed and would you do on the same setting or so the... yeah so um, i mean we are going with the working diagnosis here that this is a post infective right yeah apparently it looks like yeah 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 so so yes correction uh, on both sides is required uh, i would kind of yes the acetabulum is a little dysplastic but uh, i would uh, you know i mean uh, i wouldn't automatically jump into a dega on the side because it's a bilateral so i think the length discrepancy may not be significant so i would do an intra op arthrogram to kind of make a final decision okay. on that that's number one um i always do these uh, bilateral ones uh, together um uh, even if it's uh, you know the it's easier to correct it's not um so the, there have been one or two instances in older child wherein i have done it in the same admission 3 4 days apart um mm -hmm. but otherwise i would do them together okay and your plan would be the same valgus yeah, so yeah so i think here the head is not very well visualized so um so whether there is uh, you know anything um you know um, additional whether um, you know an additional imaging is necessary that's something which you need to kind of factor it but i think there is a uh, uh, lot of the head is probably cartilaginous and still not there so an intra op yeah. arthrogram will give you enough information about it to kind of locate your uh, where the head is and to position your proximal screws what thing puzzled me is uh, like the he angle is more severe on the right compared to left yeah but still the acetabular dysplasia yeah. is uh, more severe on the left yeah. than right So, so the problem with H E angle, which I have found again, you know, it's like where you draw your orientation. Ah. You have this triangular segment to which side of the triangle. So, if I say that you drew it in a little bit more horizontal, so yeah, uh, I would kind of, I mean, these were useful predictors. There's no doubt about it. But I wouldn't kind of use that measure alone to mm -hmm. kind of this thing. And once you know the vices closes off, you know, a lot of them close off, and then you don't mm. know what the H E angle is uh, at all. So. So especially in the septic septic ones they they fuse and uh, yeah. it's a problem yeah? yeah 
So, uh, Prasad, your take on this, or uh, would you do anything differently, or you anticipate any problem correction? Yeah, on, on the left side, I'm not sure if it's going to behave like a developmental coxabera, so I won't care about that angle. I don't think mm. that the neck is going to grow much, so I won't mm. be in any hurry to fix the left side. The left okay. side, the varus, only helps the establum. Mm. In some of these cases, I don't need to correct the var valgus varus all the way. I can yeah. leave some varus mm. along with that impinging and compensate for the established dysplasia. Mm -hmm. It's the ones with the developmental cocks are where, uh, where the angle has to be corrected is where I go for more correction. Okay. The also issue is if you correct on one side, no, the, there will be a limb, limb length discrepancy. And uh, that will lead to some other issues, you know. Anyway, well, so like, yeah, I got it, Prasad. You, you are thinking in terms of preserving this hip. So doing a bit of more correction may lead to more challenge rather than that. I, I got your point. Yeah, Shalin, can you go ahead and show what was yes. done? Yes. So the principles are already been covered by Dr. Manoj, sir. And uh, so we plan for a transverse osteotomy and uh, convert, converting uh, and achieving a more better angle for these hips and using a locking compression plate. So we, uh, as I said, we plan for uh, an end to side type of osteotomy. We did the adduction views and uh, we saw at which angles we could get the trochanter to at least line up with, in line with the head. We planned for a transverse osteotomy, uh, correction and fixation with a locking compression plate. We did the same planning for the left side also as we were planning for a stage, uh, a, a stage a bilateral surgery in a, say, uh, in a single V. And uh, similar transfers osteotomy and correction and translation of the femur was planned. So this was the pre-op X-ray and uh, this is what we could achieve post-operatively. We also have a better image uh, at uh, six months follow-up. We could achieve a, a significant correction in the HE angle on the right as well as the left side. So Manoj, we at did an R program. The osteotomies have been <clears throat> well. Just a moment. Can you go a slide back? So we, we did an arthrogram, Manoj. Yeah. And then, uh, although it, the screws are looking like uh, is out of the bone, but there is a huge cartilage over it. Yeah. And uh, probably this was the smallest screw or something, I don't know. And the second side, when we tried to do, like uh, the implants were not available from the prototype uh, providers. And so we resor resorted to this uh, conventional locking recon plate. Yeah. Uh, yes, so, that's what I mean, we got. See, for the arthrogram, you know, I mean, I would once you achieve your correction, you you if you're sure that there is no instability there, you know, because yeah. on the left side is definitely a concern. Um, and if that's no case, then then this is good enough, you know. I mean, so long as uh, you know the screws, you're comfortable with where it is. The only thing is, like uh, on this uh, left side, you know, it looks like it medially translated. The implants are very prominent so i'm going to remove them and see yeah. Yeah. yeah this is the frog view you see yeah <clears throat> and uh, the child has good correction of his gait also the redenlenberg gait has improved the foot progression angle have improved quite significantly from the pre operative state and uh, his Prominent lumbar lordosis has improved from the preoperative state as well. We are expecting more correction as the child grows, as we have also addressed the trochanter by the plate on the left side, and we're waiting after the implant removal. So we'll progress now. Yeah. So one, yeah, one more thing is like uh, we need to correct the reversion. So. Yeah. So how you choose, how you decide to correct the version Manoj on table? You just neutralize the extremity while you fix the distal fragment. What do you do? So, so I mean, so in all this uh, um, uh, pathologies with such uh, florid radiological findings, you really need to have a pre-op torsional profile evaluation. Um, you know, that's a clinical torsional profile evaluation to clearly see what is asymmetry. At the end of the day, uh, you know, you want symmetry. So you want to create torsion, which is like, you know, so that the foot progression and 
um, is, is symmetrical. Um, they almost in, in developmental cases and congenital cases is almost always retroversion. Um, and so, so I would just want it to be corrected up to neutral. I don't want to kind of, you know, get it into, uh, so they will have some difficulty with extreme uh, rotational positions like sitting cross legs and things like that. But uh, you want symmetry, you want to correct it to neutral. In post-septic sequelae or in um, DDH and stuff like that, which is the thing, you will find that they are not in the usually increased antiversion there. Um, uh, post-septic sequelae, I've usually found that there is increased antiversion. So I just want to correct it to neutral alignment and symmetry. Right. So, I, Prasad, any comment on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, two, two points. Uh, I don't do any preoperative rotational profile because intraoperatively, what I get at the end is what I need. So I provisionally hold the plate against the shaft and check my rotations, internal and external, maybe put one screw in, right, the middle screw, and adjust it as needed so that I can get about 20, 30 degrees of flexion internal rotation and maximize my external rotation. I mean, it's a balance. You get only one, you get to take one or the other. So about 20, 30 internal and then about whatever you get for external is what I aim for. One point for fellows. If you look at this head, right, it, look, it, still, it still looks like a little bit of varus, but the head actually is maybe relatively in valgus compared to the stable. So think about where the fovea is, not in, in this particular case, but anytime you do valgus osteotomies, you need to look at the head rotation in the head, in the stable. The fovea may be already high. The valgus osteotomy may bring the fovea against the stable roof that cause foveal impingement and pain afterwards. So valgus is not a, a benign thing. It can cause secondary intra-article intra impingement from the fovea going to the sore seal. That's it. Yeah. So there's a very fine balance of progressive coxavara and secondary impingement. So sooner or later, we all those who are doing this coxavara correction also will also learn the hip preservation. Because as you explain you know, become a bit senior in your practice, you have to have more and more help from hip preservation surgeons. So I think that will become the norm part of practice. Yeah. So I thank uh, Dr. Manoj for this lovely presentation and uh, Prasad for his input. Shinam and Shalin, nice. Shalin was presenting from Vadia OPD probably. So thanks Shalin for your time. And uh, your questions, please forward it to Dr. Gaurav and he will uh, communicate with uh, Manoj and will get back to you. Sheenam would send five landmark papers on Coxavera PDFs. And I hope uh, you can communicate with the faculties whenever you are in doubt. Thank you very right. much. Bye See, you next, <laughs> See you next week uh, with the basics of uh, DDH, polic hardness and uh, close reduction by Dr. Ramani from Delhi. So. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Manoj. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Gaurav.